Iowa City is a unique community. This uniqueness is shaped by the people who contribute their time, their energy, and their ideas to Iowa City and the university. Welcome to a series of biographical interviews of special women and men who have affected this community. Their contributions have been valuable, their lives creative and full. What brought them here? Who influenced them? What contributions are they the most pleased about? These and other questions will be explored during this series of interviews entitled, Tell Me Your Story. Dr. Lois Bolar is a woman of incredible energy, determination, and compassion. Dr. B, as she is fondly called, graduated from the University of Iowa College of Medicine in 1937 and served for more than 33 years with the University of Iowa's student health. After a short retirement in 1971, Dr. B, at the young age of 68, launched a second career. She started the very successful patient service representative program at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. This concept and program flourished and has impacted positively on patients, staff, and visitors. It has grown from a one-woman show to eight patient reps now, half are full-time and half are part-time. Welcome, Dr. Bowar, to Tell Me Your Story. And your story begins, I know, in Missouri, where you were born in 1903. You told me before the interview that you came from a strong, a long line of strong women. What were your parents' expectations of you and your families? Well, to learn to work and enjoy working and to go as far as I could go. Which you did. <laughs> and your, your mother was quite a remarkable woman. You said that she was uh, determined and um, did some unusual things. Well, she came from a long line of pioneers. Mm -hmm. And uh, her father came as a young man, an expert woodsman, who started west when he was 16 and made his way across the country. I was thinking this morning as we came over how really unusual it was that I was able to talk to my own grandfather about his early days in moving west and going on. He, he, as before he was 20, he had gone all the way to California with a wagon train with mm. two young companions and joined the wagon train until it wintered in the Rockies, and they were impatient. They walked the rest of the way to California. And then he Without came back. The train. Did he come back? Then he came back to Missouri and settled. Oh, yes. His two friends stayed out there, and they kept in touch all their lives. I mm -hmm. remember meeting them when I was a child. And uh, he, but he came back through the, uh, through the Isthmus of Panama. Of course, there was no canal. He, they came by mm -hmm. sailing ship. Down to the down to Panama and across there, and then he got somehow to New Orleans and came up the Mississippi on a steamboat. What did your father do? My father was, as a young man, was he had wanted to be a veterinarian. I'm not sure how much time he put in on it because he was a, a something of a playboy of his day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, his father put him on a a, a section of land, my and. He was supposed to to work the section of land and look mm -hmm. after the hired people. And, and uh, my grandfather's thing was land buying and selling and shipping Texas cattle uh, to be fattened for the markets in Kansas City. They brought in the Longhorn steers and, mm -hmm. and fed them and took them to either Kansas City or St. Joe. But he was in that business. He was doing what his father told him. At that point, <laughs> when did you decide to to go to medical school? Well, I went to college, uh, the school my family had been respond, uh, responsible for and interested in for many years, and uh, I thought because I lived with books all the time that I would uh, like to do journalism, which at which I shudder. Uh, 
from this perspective because uh, that wasn't my thing. But I took zoology as my freshman science course, and the minute I saw that frog, I was really turned on. I thought it was the most fascinating piece of equipment I'd ever seen in my life. And the mechanics of the whole thing, and from that day, I wanted to study medicine. That's remarkable. So how did you get to the student health at the university? You were in, you came to Iowa to I medical school. I came to school. Iowa and uh, with the expert, this was depression. Nobody had any money. There were on campus, I think, about 6,000 students at that time. Were your parents still living, Dr. Bowler, oh, yes. when you started to medical oh, school? Yes. Oh, yes, they lived in Missouri and they helped what they could, but nobody mm -hmm. had money. And uh, I was try I tried to go to uh, find something that would be in the health care services and that I could prepare for. And I had a vague idea of physical therapy or something of, of that sort. Well, actually, I, I, I uh, uh, ended up a graduate student because medical school was just not in the picture. But over two or three years, uh, I got a ma and I got a master's degree in physiology and physical education. At that time, physical education was I'd always like sports, and that's as far as it went. And but physical education was the requirement for physical therapy training. But in the meantime, a situation came up where I saw I was offered uh, financing for medical school. It was a real secret deal, and it was a real personal deal with a ver an old couple who had, uh, who uh, was the uh, uncle and aunt of uh, one of my good friends, who never even knew that this was happening. Hmm. And they put up the money. And they put up the money. And I took a good deal less than I did for most people because I worked a board job all four years, and, and my folks helped me what they could. Hmm. and. And I went on from there, and it was just a How joy. many women in your class? Six. And how many men? Uh, well, on day one, there were, there were uh, uh, the total class on day one was 101. On day two, it was 100, because one fellow disappeared. He, he, one day was long <laughs> enough in medical school for him. <laughs> I, I'm sure you were treated no differently than um, the, your other classmates because you were a woman, because you seemed to be pretty independent. Well, uh, you have to have reasonable expectations. I had no sisters, and I had two brothers, and I figured you'd get along with men anywhere. You'd get along with them there, too, and that's the way it turned out. So you're, when, you, when you were a senior in medical school, is this when the university approached you about maybe staying on? Dr. And Milford Barnes, who was the head of hygiene and preventive medicine at that time and who had a great interest in the health of students mm -hmm. and felt it was a primary responsibility of the university to may, not only maintain the health of students, but to show them what medical care could be and should be. Mm -hmm. So he had asked me when I was a senior if I would be willing to come back uh, after my postgraduate training. And uh, since I was in debt at what I thought was an astronomical level, which I see now as being very modest, actually, uh, and I was very happy to come back because I knew some of the staff over there and uh, and I liked working with young people so back I came mm -hmm. and I was hooked and you were hooked <laughs> is it true what you said once I read an article that you 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 viewed yourself at one time a hospital junkie oh sure <laughs> by the time I was ready to retire I had a terrible time uh, uh, repeating the uh, I had a terrible time adjusting to the fact that my time was not organized was not it was not uh, programmed mm -hmm. as I had been programmed for so many years mm -hmm. and well I you you put in such a day, long day didn't you sometimes see 30 40 patients uh, yeah, when you were but, in student health but uh, they moved along pretty fast and it was so interesting it was an incredibly interesting thing in that every the people the patients were had different problems although there was a similar thread running through, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I never, I, I, I never remember ever thinking that I wish I didn't have to go to work. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Not many people can say that. In all those years. Mm-hmm. Now, there's some days I'd just as soon play golf, <laughs> but I didn't mean that I wish I didn't have mm-hmm. to go to work. Now, after these many, many years seeing students for 33, I guess, in 1971, you retired. But uh, most not people. Not from choice. Not from choice. <laughs> but usually, uh, you were 68 at the time. Most people at that age would go stick their toes in the sand or water, and, and you didn't. Your retirement lasted, what, four months, Dr. B? Yes, well, now I felt no pain during that four months, So I spe- because in the meantime, I had acquired a, an island in Canada and had been going there for years and years and years. And uh, At the end of that time, coming back here at the end of August, getting too cold up there, mm-hmm. I said, what do I do now? And I didn't know. I knew there was something I should do, mm-hmm. but I didn't know what it was. And in September of that year, in Time Magazine, I read an article in the medical section about a program that had been started in a New York hospital by a nurse named Ann Cote. And uh, she had had an injury in the course of her work. I think some heavy x-ray equipment had fallen on her. She had been put in traction in her own hospital and she was so horrified by the lack of communication between what I call the horizontal in the hospital and the perpendicular uh, that she got two or three of her friends, uh, one of whom was a nurse and I think maybe two of them. I since I, I subsequently uh, came to know Anne could take quite well on the national level as we were organizing the, uh, uh, as we were expanding the patient representative program, mm-hmm. which is in hundreds and hundreds of hospitals now. Uh, but she, uh, they started talking about this, how there should be some better means of communication uh, because of the stress levels and so on. There was a response. It isn't that the staff didn't care, it's just that they were, they too had their primary jobs and it took so much time you didn't realize. Nobody comes into the door of a hospital who isn't under stress for himself or somebody else. Mm -hmm. So you had this idea, you read it, you were retired and you were wanting to get back involved in something in the health care. So So you went, so what, what was the process to get this so successful program going? Well... It was very iffy at first, but I uh, I got in touch with Mr. Collin uh, through some other staff people, and they were interested. And I just sent put a uh, photostat of the article on his desk, and the next thing I heard from Mr. Collin said I. I have heard at the American Hospital Association rumors that this is the coming thing, and uh, we're very interested. In, and but we, there's no, there's no pattern. How do we start? I said I don't know either. We the only way to start I know of is just to start. So I said I'll bring my own typewriter. I'll bring my own tape recorder, and you provide me with a telephone and a desk, and and we'll go. And a beeper. Didn't you have a beeper? And a beeper. And sure. you kept a diary. Uh, well, I kept a diary out of my own ignorance because uh, I didn't know how to document what was going and what what could go or could go right or wrong, for that matter. So every day I, t- I typed out a summary of the types of people I had talked to and the types of problems that I saw, and uh, I turned them um, I turned them in each week to. Uh, I wasn't very good to Mr. Collin. I wasn't very good typist, but um, he got the general idea. And uh, a little later, I said to Bob Raisley on his on Mr. Collin's staff, "Does anybody know what in the world I do around here?" That isn't exactly the way I said it, but <laughs> but <laughs> but that was the question. He said, "I use them every day in teaching hospital administration." Your comments in the diary. Yes. Um, well, my my documentation mm-hmm. of, of the kind of problems that you want to do and the kind of anxieties that you deal with with patients. Some of them absurd, some of them really 
very um, real. Didn't you, you told me about a man who, um, here are, here's a couple problems you told me about earlier. A man was going to check himself out of the hospital because he didn't, he didn't feel he was, what was, what was going, going on. on. This, this was the nicest old boy, and we had a lot in common because he was, he was interested in fishing, and I, I fished uh, six weeks in the summer up there for years and years, and we knew, he knew all about lures and sizes and everything like that. <laughs> we had a great time, so I used to, I visited with him several days, and one day he says, I'm gonna sign myself out of this damn place. He said, I'm a private patient, and uh, whatever that concept is, now we don't, you don't know the difference, and didn't much then, because you're a patient, you're a patient, you got the whole, you got the whole ball of wax. Uh, but he said nobody tells me anything. He said those guys all come in in those white coats and they yammer around and they and I don't understand a word they're saying and and uh, and I I don't know. They stick me and they punch me and they do that sort of thing. And I said, well, let me look into it. Let's see what. Now what I uh, I looked at his chart and found out who his surgeon was, the head of his team. Went down to this doctor's office and he wasn't there I just left a note on his desk and I said Mr. So-and-so is very uh, upset because he understands so little of what is going on and the next day when I stopped by to see them and I left it at that it wasn't up to me I'm, I was passing a word this is and uh, next day I went in and sat down well how are things he would have stayed all summer at that point because he said the doctor came in within an hour after I'd been there and sat on chair and said, just tell me any, ask me anything you want to. I thought you understood more what we had in mind. And his problems were solved hmm. because communication. he understood. It was all in communication. Yep. And the course, the longer, the longer I live, the more I'm sure that almost all snafus, either personal or uh, on a much wider basis are due to lack of communication. Another story you told me was about a woman who told you when you went in to see, you, she had a problem and she said that one of the nurses didn't like her. Yes, that's, and you, how did you solve that this one? one that, well, I didn't solve it. I just keyed other people to solve it. It wasn't my problem, but just, I, uh, this woman had been transferred from one area of the hospital to another and she didn't like it up here and she wanted to be transferred back. Well, the point was, because the nurse didn't like her. The nurse liked the woman in the room with her. It was a two-bedroom. It was a two-bedroom. She paid no attention to my, to my client, my friend, my, uh, my patient. And I went out and talked to the nurse and said, you know, something is wrong here in the communication system or there is some misunderstanding somewhere. And this patient has gotten the idea that she's being rejected uh, because you are much more interested in the other patient. She said, oh, I'm not supposed to take care of her. Uh, my assignment is to the other patient and this is, and there's another. I said, well, could you, just subtly give her the reassurance that this is not your job, but that you are interested, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact it's not your assignment, and clue in the, clue in the her nurse to to make this very clear too. It just solved itself. That was the end of that. She would, she didn't want to move anymore. It was just so simple. Mm -hmm. If you touch the right buttons, make the right connections. Tell me as you were interpreting and communicating and trying to hear people's problems, what was the staff's reaction to you in this position of kind of an ombudsman? Um, well, I think it was very mixed. Uh, Mr. Collin had me meet with the hospital advisory committee, which is made up of <coughs> department heads of the whole organization. And in the discussion, my ideas were pretty nebulous at that point, I must might say, but I was sort of playing it by ear. And, and one staff member, my friend, uh, one of my really friends, uh, said, don't you think you are uh, 
uh, overqualified. Mm -hmm. My reply to that was not exactly eloquent, but I think the meaning came across, that we're never overqualified for any job to which we are really committed. Mm -hmm. Every experience of our lives can be used to bear upon whatever. Mm. If I, and I, said, I think I said that that day, if I had a job in housekeeping to which I was committed, every experience I have ever had would have a bearing on it. Mm. You never know, hoard all these things, you never know where you're gonna need it, whatever you're, whatever you're doing, whatever you observe, whatever you understand. And, well, anyway. So the staff I, felt, I mean, they felt that you were a team once, rather than you weren't well, I meddling. Well, I don't know how they felt, but they, didn't, they weren't threatened at mm -hmm. all. And uh, from the beginning, the understanding of the patient representative is that they do not necessarily have to go through channels uh, to get anything done. Mm -hmm. I, it's what I call a trickle-down theory. Uh, nothing ever trickles uphill. <laughs> and, uh, Is that a Missouri statement? <laughs> <laughs> and if you have access and use good judgment mm -hmm. as to giving the information, then it will trickle down. So you always go to the top. That's right. You always go to the top. You go to the top when it warrants it. Mm -hmm. There are much, there are lower levels on which one must, uh, one can, can operate too. And you just have to use the best judgment you have on that. Well, Dr. Bower, you were asked to explain the patient representative program, and I want you to read the um, or statement me, of, pr yeah. rather, of purpose, which now hangs in the patient representative service office at the university hospitals. But there's a story behind you writing this. Tell us a story, and then would you read that? Because I think it really sums up wonderfully the program? Well, early on, we made a real effort to explain the program. But in the meantime, Dorothy Rogers, who's, uh, who's from Mount Vernon, who's had a master's in child development, and raised a family of five, and uh, was a very interested outgoing person had heard about this and she was very involved with St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids and she, uh, they had said when we get around to it we would like you to do this. She called me a month into this job. She called me and she said, I've heard about what you're doing down there. Could I, uh, could I come down and get ideas and see uh, what you're doing? I said, well, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know um, what I'm doing either. But we do it from day to day, and you come down and stay a while and see how see how you like it. Well, she was a natural, an absolute natural person uh, to do this sort of thing. She was a born communicator, and her experience, of course, had been uh, very uh, uh, applicable to doing this mm -hmm. sort of thing. So she came down, and subsequently, to to, to shorten this, subsequently she. Uh, uh, Came on the program and was directed after the year after I left, and and was a terribly effective person in the whole situation. Well, we made an effort to be over to to spread the word, to try to explain what we were doing to Iowa City. I have always said that Iowa City had the largest reservoir of unused talent in, in the world. We had already they had already used at the hospital a good deal of the diversity in foreign languages because we had so many foreign students mm -hmm. or wives of students who were educated people and available for for translations and then we have a great many uh, uh, problems in that case subsequently they had full-time mm -hmm. uh, uh, interpreters in the hospital but anyway uh, we, I went off to Europe I think this was in 77 76, and Dorothy had to fill in for me to make a speech. And some woman so we, we had looked for places to talk to people and explain them what we had in mind. And so I wrote her from JFK Airport as I was thinking, ready, waiting for the plane uh, to take off. And I said, these are the points, and I, we didn't have time to talk about it, but I said, these are the points I wanted, want us always to make on these things. And I quote, we are not do-gooders, 
or bleeding hearts. We are not adversaries. We are not passive collectors of complaints. We are active observers. We listen, we communicate, and we seek to be catalysts. We are fully accountable, and our assignment within the administrative framework is to constantly seek maximum response to the needs of our patients and visitors. So oh, it's a wonderful Dorothy way. like that. So they, and they've used that. It they, hangs in the office. Yeah, yeah. Another need you saw, which was so important and which bears your name, is the Day of Surgery Lounge. How did that? Can you tell us how that evolved? Well, there's so many large problems when you, when you think about uh, what goes on in a hospital, and it's so complex, and the thousands of people and the thousands of situations. So uh, I was finding that there were people scattered all over the hospital with people in emergency, with with the people they cared about in emergency, they're for accidents or in other areas, uh, or in just general scheduled surgery, or all that sort of thing, who had a hard time getting information about what was going on and how far along. They were over anxious, you understand. You've got to accept that in people. But uh, uh, the real, there was no real central source of uh, information available. Mm -hmm. So you, it, you th we thought that if we had a central area with central intelligence <laughs> there that everybody could be found and not be all over the hospital. Even when the doctor was there trying to find the family, that mm -hmm. would become something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the family couldn't find the doctor, sometimes the doctor couldn't find the family. There was a confusion of what was going on. So we thought if we had a, a central area with knowledgeable people, somebody who knew the territory, Hmm. In this and, and access, and now we have access, everything is computerized and they get messages back and forth from the, from the uh, operating room if, a, if a, the family is always set. Now, if the uh, operation is delayed, why, they're notified. It's delayed. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. The doctor will be down as soon as the, to talk to you in the conference room as soon as the sur as this thing is settled and the surgery is done. Or if he doesn't, he will send somebody. Mm -hmm. And so all the, all the people are there and the questions are answered. And then volunteers, this is another story and later and not time for this today, but they are taken then to the proper area in the hospital, not just sent off and saying, find this place or that place, mm -hmm. which is... It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful service. So uh, when you're under that, as you said... It has out awfully well. We had people down here in the first year or two of that, uh, of that organization, uh, that uh, location and uh, uh, mindset of answering all these immediate problems. We had people from the Mayo Clinic and we had a lot of people, but they had a hard time with it up there with their staff. They had a, and, they, and there was a woman who was on, that, on a board up there who had a brother here that, that she wanted very much to get it started. I don't know what that subsequently mm -hmm. uh, happened out on that. But it has been a rewarding thing to families and patients. Certainly. And it's worked because the people who started the service were retired nurses who knew, the, or retired or uh, mm -hmm. nurses who uh, had chosen not Doctor. to work full-time jobs. Dr. B, my last question. I, I've got so many others, but we'll have to. You'll have to come back, and we'll have to continue this uh, conversation. Looking over all the things you've done and been involved in, who influenced you? Looking back in your life, oh, I don't. I don't suppose anybody really knows who did the most. I came from a from a family with a, a great, uh, great many, uh, as I see it now, a great many strong women, not aggressive, not bulldozers. Maybe I. Should, maybe they are just survivors and people with great, with confidence and. Uh, hopes of bettering everything for themselves and for their children. And bettering themselves, you, you told me that a minister 
gave you the most well, I remarkable. Into, I went to a small church-related college, as I, I think I may have mentioned, but we had to take six hours of Bible. Uh, if we got a degree, and I, some did and some didn't. But anyway, out of that, the theologian who taught that was a remarkable man of Graduate University of Chicago, and so far ahead of uh, what was the general teaching in theology at that time. He was always throwing out ideas that just shook you up and you didn't know whether he was goofy or you were goofy. But one time in class, the, one, the only thing I remember in that whole semester was the discussion. We had, there were lots of discussions, but this particular one, he was trying to get some input as to what our definition of sin was. And as it came out, he tossed in at the very end his definition of sin. And it was three words, failure to grow. And it, it's made an impact on my whole life. And I think looking over your life, you have lived, you have grown and taken on challenges. And I thank you so much for being my guest today, Dr. B. My guest has been Dr. Lois Bowar a graduate of Iowa's College of Medicine. She served for more than 33 years with a student health at the university. Her second career began in 1971 when at the age of 68, she created the very successful patient service representative program at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. This program was described using Dr. B's words as, quote, promoting communications between the perpendicular and the horizontal inhabitants of the hospital. Her energetic spirit has touched hundreds of students, hospital patients, staff, and volunteers. And it seems only fitting that the University uh, Day of Surgery Lounge bears her name. She has helped make the hospital a more humane place. Iowa City and the University are fortunate that Dr. Lois Bowar made this community her home. <laughs>